So next we have um, Yosef Barash, who's in a, a Lego race at the moment, it would appear. Um, it looks kind of scary at the moment, but I think it'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> I like your background. So, um, do you, can you tell I have a 10 year old at home? Possibly, or yeah. it's okay. It, it, it's Star Wars Lego, man, it's <laughs> the best. Yes, uh, so, so um, Yosef uh, grew up in, in Israel and, and did his bachelor's and PhD at the Hebrew University, um, studying uh, machine learning and, and probabilistic models and, and, and all things that are beyond my knowledge. Um, subsequently went to um, University of Toronto as a, as a postdoc with Brendan Fry and, and Ben Blanco and really did um, wonderful work on the, the splicing code and really understanding um, how many of the things that we're interested in are, are regulated. Um, he came to Penn in 2012 as an assistant professor in both the School of Medicine in the Department of Genetics, as well as in the School of Engineering in Computer and Information um, Science. And he was uh, promoted with tenure uh, to associate professor in 2018. Um, today, as you can see on his slide, he'll talk about um, splicing quantification um, from RNA-seq, how to get the signal out of the noise. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, so we'll jump right in. Uh, I'm going to talk about splicing quantification from RNA sequencing, and uh, hopefully we all want to know how to get the signal out of that noise. Obviously, there's a lot of noise involved. So I'll jump right in. Uh, let's see if this works. Yes. Everybody can see my slide, Jeremy. Is that okay? Yep, perfect. Great. Okay, so the way we quantify splicing from RNA sequencing, the gist of it, very simple. We're looking at mostly at junction spanning reads. What we're seeing here, there's an exon on the left and we see junction spanning reads connecting it to the next exon or skipping an exon. And let's say we saw 30 junctions going into the first exon and 10 junctions going into the next exon. Then basically our algorithm, pick your poison, is going to say, well, the percent spliced in of that uh, middle cassette exon is, you know, 75% or the psi is 0.75. And of course, the algorithms have to do way more than that, but um, uh, take into account different things, but that's the gist of it. This is how we quantify splicing uh, in, in general uh, here and, and, and throughout the talk. So in 2016, we came up with a, a, a sort of a, a a slightly different ways, alternative way to look and uh, to detect, quantify, and visualize splicing variations in the transcriptome. That was a paper we published in eLife in 2016. And the idea was very simple. If we look again at the gene splice graph where the exons are the rectangles and the connecting edges are all those splicing events between those exons, every time we see a split of the graph coming out of an exon or into an exon, we say this is a local splicing variation. This is an LSV, and we can quantify the ratio of those size that we just talked about. And why this is beneficial as a language to use to look at splicing? Well, that captures all of those classical events that we've been studying in the RNA field for, for decades, like cassette exon and three prime and five prime, but it also enables us to now capture many more variations and more complex one involving multiple junctions, multiple exons, and combinations of them, et cetera. And so just to see how that looks like, and this is something that how we quantify and how we visualize this is something that comes out of our software that we published then, uh, uh, the Magic software. And this is how the output would look like. This is a splice graph coming out of there. Again, exons are the rectangles and the junctions are those arcs. And you can see red arcs corresponding with the number of reads corresponding to known annotated junctions and green ones also detecting de novo unannotated uh, junctions, which the tool can incorporate and build new splice graphs uh, around them. And so if we zoom in on this event of complex event here that we see here, the cartoon that the software Magic is going to produce for it is going to look like this, where exon eight is connected to three other exons upstream of it. Each one of them gets a color. And then the algorithm Magic is going to quantify the percent spliced in for each one of those connections. You can see it as a, as a violin plot because this is a Bayesian model giving us some posterior distribution for the percent spliced in for each one of them, something between zero and one or zero and 
And, uh, and similarly, if we look at differences between conditions, then it would be delta psi, the changes of inclusion somewhere between minus one or one or uh, minus 100% and plus 100%. And that would be the differential space. Okay. So with Magic One that we published then, we were able to capture complex slicing variations, just like I showed you, de novo junctions, de novo exons. We were able to detect and quantify de novo intron retentions as well, built-in visualization, just like we see here. We also uh, published a accompanying tool that enabled you to you know, click that LSD, copy it, and do primary design for it. And then we also showed that uh, compared to a lot of the tools out there, it was highly accurate and reproducible in terms of the analysis that it produced. So moving now to what we are currently talking about is Magic 2, what are the changes? Well, what we needed is to handle heterogeneous and or large scale data sets like Target and GTEx. And notice that I separated heterogeneous and large. Obviously, large tend to be heterogeneous, but you can have heterogeneous data set even within your lab that you only produce a few samples. For example, we work with a collaborator where they're picking samples out of mice from the area of the hippocampus. And of course, depending on where you scoop and the mixture of the cells and the conditions, you're going to get maybe three but they're going to be have quite a lot of variability. And you have to account for this to really find out what is uh, reproducible. So heterogeneous doesn't have to be large. And then those heterogeneous and large data sets uh, give us a lot of new challenges. So as you pick more and more samples, you find more and more complexity and more and more de novo events. And then the question is, what's the signal? What's the noise? What we should be focused on? As I mentioned, the data can be a lot, uh, uh, very uh, heterogeneous. The sheer data size means you have to be very efficient both in memory and, and compute time. And then the other issue is confounding factors, especially if you're doing this across multiple uh, um, centers, et cetera. And so let's start with those, uh, the, that last one as a channel, as a challenge. And what I show here is this is, this is a simple, small data set. Okay, so it's not multi-center. It's something that you could have produced maybe in your lab. This is a collaborator from Penn. And we have those samples. Now, instead of psi between zero and one, we have color codes for, for the psi values, but events are the rows here and the samples are columns. And if you cluster them, you get this clustering where you see very clear three clusters. Unfortunately for us, those clusters correspond perfectly to the batches that they were processed, okay? And this is after controlling for gender and age and all that stuff where you would do a good design, but still the batches are the main signal that we're seeing here. So in this case, this is cancer data. And let's say you wanna do uh, detect subtypes of cancer, which would be the focus of maybe another talk that we could give, but not today. This signal stands out and sort of interferes with anything else that you wanna do downstream. So what do we do? So you say, okay, we want to take those psi values, those inclusion levels and clean them up, cleaning up the, those junction spanning reads, correcting them. So now I get corrected psi still between zero and one, corrected, and now I can do differential splicing, I can do clustering, whatever I need to do. So I just need to apply a tool to do this, and then I can go about analyzing my, my case of data in this case. And this is the list of current solutions that we found. So it's, it's, that basically sums it up. Uh, and just to sort of drive home that uh, message, when we did the literature search, we found that if you search for batch effect and expression, this is the distribution of publications in PubMed that we can count. If you look for batch effects and splicing, this is the distribution at the bottom that you see for, uh, for uh, these publications. So there is a lack of tools to do this psi correction. Just to be fair, if you want to do differential splicing and just get that, there are several tools that will do differential splicing with known confounding factors. But as far as we know, for spy space, to do that correction also with unknown confounders and give you a corrected psi, we are not aware of, of such tools. And, and, and the lack of publications may be possibly point to the lack of awareness in the field that this is a major issue. And the question, well, is it a major issue? So we went to check because we didn't see publications that map that. And this is the target data set. So this is 
ALL cancer data, several hundred samples, is a highly used uh, resource by many labs. And this is a two-dimensional UMAP embedding of the variability between the samples. And this is for expression data, OK? And what you see here, two colors representing the difference in sequencing machine that were used for this uh, data. And you can see very clear differences. 6.7% of the variability can be in this data can be explained by the sequencing machine. The, the symbols that you see here is the same patient Different samples, both primary and relapse samples, some of them from different sequencing machine. And you can see that they basically cluster by the sequencing machine, unfortunately, although it's the same patient. OK, so you might say, OK, this is cancer, and I don't cancer, I don't do cancer, so I don't have to worry about this. Uh, this is ENCO data, RBP's knockdown, which you might very well be using all the time to, to go after hypothesis in your lab. And this is 36 different batches. And again, the embedding, and you can see it's very clearly embedded by batches. And this is the marks here are UTOAF uh, to knockdown. And you can see that those samples don't cluster by the fact that it's the RBP, but by cluster. OK, so that's expression, which there are tools to fix. What about splicing? And here are the results for splicing. And you can see it's even worse, right? So it's 15.9% and 46% and very clear batch effects. So in order to handle this, we developed Moccasin, which is a new tool. There's a bioarchive for this already available. And we're currently uh, busy submitting the, the revision for this with updates and improvements for the model and the paper. But let me show you how it works. So this is ENCODE psi or delta psi for the knockdowns. After we fixed it, you can see the U2OF samples now cluster very nicely together. Only 4.3% of the variation is associated with, with batches. And you can see they're all together. And this is target. This is what we put in the bioarchive. And you can see now that the samples from the same patient very nicely clustered together. And we were able to remove this. But at the same time, look at this figure. And this is something that we didn't uh, include in the original bioarchive paper. You can see very clear clusters here in structure. And we were wondering about this. So Moccasin also allows you to uh, correct for unknown confounding factors. And when we do this, we can get rid of this. But then the question is, what was going on here? So we checked. And then we found in our annotation that what we missed is there was also differences in the cells that were used, the B cells and the T cells, which made perfect sense. And that was that major signal. But some of those samples missed the annotation. So based on this analysis, we were able to infer the annotation and redo the analysis, which is something that we're going to include in the revision. And now you can see those left and right are those two cell types. And you can see the mixing. And you can see the separation for uh, primary and relapse and correction for um, uh, sequencing machine. So for me, the picture on the right that you see here is extremely satisfying. Um, and just to show you the effect on true signal, we're comparing primary versus relapse uh, in, in those samples. And on the y-axis, you see primary versus relapse when it's the same sequencing, um, it's a different sequencing machine, sorry. And on the x-axis, it's primary relapse when you're using the same sequencing machine. And on the left, you see before we applied moccasin, there's good correlation, but after we fixed it with moccasin, you see much, much better uh, correlation. We have similar results for ENCODE uh, as well. Okay, just going back to the original data set from the collaborators, you can see that it also fixes it, which means I would highly encourage you, if you have a data set and you suspect you should be checking whether you have confounders or whether you have batches, even if it's your own lab, and if you need to, you should be able to apply moccasin and, and, and fix it. And if you're wondering, well, it's going to take me days to just do this. So this is how much time it takes to fix 16 samples. Uh, what you're seeing here, the y-axis on the left are seconds. So we're talking about 40 seconds time to fix 16 RNA sequencing samples, doing this batch correction. These are magic files after we process them and then uh, for the mouth is output, and the, the memory consumption is less than one gig, so that means you can run it on your laptop. So it's very efficient. And speaking of efficiency, going back to the Magic version two algorithm, and that involves a lot of people doing different aspects of what I'm just going to talk to you uh, in the next few uh, minutes. 
that are shown here on the left. So uh, in terms of finishing, Magic is two is so much more efficient. Uh, to illustrate that this is 13 GTEx version seven uh, uh, tissues, almost 1200 samples. Single desktop machines with 12 threads is able to process this data in 12 hours to build the splice graphs for all the genes and 18 hours to quantify all of them. And since then, we've processed GTEx version 8, the entire bit, which is almost 20,000 uh, uh, samples. And I'm going to show you results from GTEx version 8 for all the brain subregions in, in, in there. And so here is, again, the issue of, um, oh, and, and one thing to, to say before that is we also studied extensively the performance in terms of accuracy for this new version uh, of Magic. And we have extensive comparisons to all the tools that we are aware that are supposed to process large data sets. We're talking about Whippet, we're talking about Supa2 and RMATS and Leaf Cutter. And uh, I'm not gonna show you this because I don't think that is the major interest of this specific audience. If we had more time, if we have questions, we can discuss this. But the bottom line is we compare very favorably. Okay, but again, signal from the noise. So one major issue when you process such data sets is you see this, what we call the water fountain, water fountain uh, effect where you see a lot of junctions. There are dashed lines here because they don't actually appear in that specific samples, but you see them in the data set or very low coverage. And so how do you clear them? You can clear them with Magic during the processing where you can remove a lot of those lowly included ones, but you can also clean them into visualization, which is what I'm showing you here. So this is the splice graph. And if you click on this and you say simplify due based on the thresholds, you get the same gene, much, much more simplified. So you can focus on what are the major uh, uh, splicing variations that you can see. And the next element, again, to try and tease out the signal from the noise is the ability to look at the various LCDs and combine them and then classify them. And so here's a story. I was a few years ago, I was in Cold Spring Harbor RNA uh, uh, meeting, and I was talking to this uh, prominent BI, and I was asking him, hey, why don't you use Magic for your analysis? And that PI told me, look, you know, I believe you that all the complexity that you're showing me is very real. And I believe you it's very accurate and it's very useful. So if I want to study a specific event and I want to see that it's real and I want to quantify it, I'm going to use it. But the problem is I need a list of all the cassette exons and I need them in a table format so I can process them downstream for clustering or studying uh, the effects of RBPs related to them, et cetera. And this output is just too complex for me. You don't give me that list. You don't give me that table. It's too complex. I can't process it. And that really stuck with me. How can we address this need while maintaining the view of the complexity and understanding all the de novo events and all the complex events, et cetera? So what we came up with as, as a solution to this is the ability to classify different types of event using modules. So what you're seeing here are different um, slice graphs for different genes. And you can see they are divided to regions that are not overlapping. And each region is like a self-contained regions of slicing variations. And now we can classify them based on the variations that we see them. We can also combine them with the simplifier to clean them out, clean out the noise. And also within each one of them classify whether they involve a cassette excellent skipping event, a three prime based uh, uh, slice variation, et cetera. And so let me show you how we can put this type of uh, uh, classifier into good use. What did here with GTEx version eight is we compared cerebellum and cerebellum hemisphere, which is in this case, uh, basically serves as biological replicates against all the other brain subregions. And so we look for consistent changes where in both cases, they appear as differentially included. And we're focusing here on the events that you see here on the top which is these cassette exons differentially included in cerebellum. Okay, and we're comparing to all of those uh, regions. And so we wanna study those. And first, first thing we do is we apply the classifier to see what types of events shoots up if we apply those classifier. And this is what we see here, right? So the most prevalent one is basically internal attention in line with the Blanco paper that pointed out to that to be uh, uh, a very uh, common 
uh, event, especially for uh, neuronal changes, although uh, many tools don't include that. So uh, that's why, you, and, and it's harder, of course, to, to quantify with RT-PCR, et cetera. And that, of course, the, the, the ratio here depends on the thresholds that you apply. But anyway, what we see is it's very common and we can see cassette exons coming in a second and a whole bunch of other ones like tandem, tandem cassettes and mutually exclusive. But then about 30% that you see here at the bottom are complex, don't fit the major types that you see here. And so the question is, are there more additional cassette exon or that are like binary like cassette exon like in those complex events? Can we tease them out and break them down into types? And the answer is yes, using this classifier with that does that for us automatically. And if we do this, what we see is 67% are pure cassette exons. There's another 25% that also involves some level of intron retention. And then there's a whole bunch of others that are more complex, about 8%, that involves other variations, but also include cassette exons. And now we can ask interesting questions, like we can say, are there differences between those that contain the introns or not, or gain more power by having more of those events and combining them together through the analysis, which is what I'll show you uh, uh, now. So if we do this and we say, what makes those cerebellum specific cassette or cassette-like events special, and we look at motifs in their uh, upstream 300 nucleotides, we map all the enriched K mirrors, five mirrors here, and we focus on those ones that are highly um, enriched here on the, on the bottom right that you see here marked with purple. And these are the top K mirror motifs. And what are those? Well, fortunately for us, that corresponds very nicely to previously understood biology by a series of papers published beautifully from my uh, postdoc advisor's lab, Ben Blanco. Uh, regarding NSL100 and its uh, partner in crime, SRSF11. And so what you're seeing here is we have a microaxon, and indeed we see a lot of those are microaxons, but not just microaxons. And we see this uh, binding motifs here upstream where S NSL100 and SRSF11 would bind to do um, uh, neuronal specific uh, splicing. And indeed, uh, and so again, th these original works were done in mice, and I'm not aware of them mapping uh, a, a previous work that does this mapping in human across uh, GDX. So that is a very nice confirmation. And if we look at expression for those, uh, we see support for those two regulators that would be regulating those two uh, highly expressed in, in uh, cerebellum specific. Um, and if we do a motif search for uh, uh, cerebellum increased inclusion, we, we find this enrichment for those motifs for NSR100 that you see here at the top and SRSF11 uh, that you see here at the bottom as we expect. And that is a great story, but the interesting part is maybe there's other regulators or alternative regulators that could be explaining this, right? And so if we go and revisit this, an interesting observation to make here is that the best clip motifs for SRSF11 uh, are CU-rich motifs, which we know also bind PTB. And that ties into a previous story that we published when we published that eLife paper on Magic, when we showed in mice that for PTB1, there is a de novo, unannotated um, cryptic exon that introduces a PTC. And the inclusion of that, that drops the uh, levels of the functional isoforms increase across developmental stages. In those late developmental stages is where also a lot of those neurons develop. And in the cerebellum, we know that there is a lot of enrichment for neurons. And so coming back to our data and doing the magic analysis, what we see here is this is the map now for human. This is the specific event that you see here. You can see it's very complex for exon 13. The cartoon is shown here on, on the left, and we can see different types of variations in human that we see in GTEx, including truncated intron retention and PTC uh, introducing exon. But the most important thing is that for cerebellum specific, we can see a, a significant drop for the isoforms for the full length uh, isoform. And just to explain what we're seeing here, every dot in those beehives 
is a sample from GTEx. So we are able to visualize and process and represent and capture analysis across all GTEx with this new type of visualization and, and quantifications very efficiently. And one of the beautiful thing about this is this can be done incrementally. So you don't have to reprocess this. If you have another batch of samples, you can basically add them so which you can now work incrementally. You don't have to reprocess everything. So to summarize, uh, the goal is to extract the signal out of the noise, map the transcriptomal variations from RNA sequencing with regards to splicing and really tease out that, that signal that we're interested in or we're after. We need a user-friendly, accurate, and fast tool to do all this. And our way to achieve that is with this new version of Magic uh, and Moccasin that I mentioned. Moccasin is already a bioarchive paper. We're hoping the paper and the tool will be out very soon. Magic 2 is already out. Some of the features are already included. And some of the new features, hopefully, will be released very soon after we release the, the bioarchive for this. Many, many, many people, uh, and we you know, encourage you to, to use this. There's a very active support group for that as well and many tutorials. Uh, many, oops, many, many people contributed to all the work on Magic that you see here marked in purple and Moccasin that are marked in, in green. And this is the funding and many collaborators that are also involved and some alumni and thank you for your time. Okay, great. So global talking or clapping. Okay. <laughs> also talking. Um, okay. So uh, Max Ferrietti has a question uh, about, I guess, really sample prep. Um, if each batch of samples has its own mock, would you still expect moccasin to identify problematic uh, batch effects for delta psi calculations? So if every batch has its own, uh, I guess what he's asking is, is every, every batch has its own control built in? I, I, yes, I would think. Yes. So. so that's exactly what happens with ENCODE. You have to give a lot of credit to the people who produced ENCODE that they were very thoughtful and they did this. So they had that built in and they also had multiple RBPs done multiple times like the UQF that I was showing. And the bottom line is definitely yes. So although you have those controls, right? They by themselves, it's not, it's not enough. And I can tell you furthermore that if you just try and compute to that reference and you say, oh, whatever the batch is, that wild type was affected. So all I need to do is just compute differential splicing to it and I should be good. I normalized it by having this. It doesn't work well. It actually doesn't work well. So you have to work hard. Yeah, it doesn't work well. But it's great to have this. Yeah. Uh, Very useful. Yeah. Uh, Logan Maroney asks um, Can Magic be used with long read data? Not at the moment. Yeah, not at the moment. But I think it's a very interesting uh, way, A, to expand it, and B, to combine Magic with long read sequencing. So if you think of it, the long reads right now are not very good in quantifying what the isoforms are. They can tell you about the existence of those, but not so much about the quantifications. And also because the coverage is so low, you never know what you're actually missing. So combining with Zik that will enable you accurate quantifications plus all the de novo that you might be missing, and then seeing how they combine into you know, full isoforms, functional isoforms, I think that is very powerful. And that's the kind of things that we do in other projects, uh, collaborative projects. Yeah, yeah um, I guess a question I'll just have is so for for all of us that are making data sets, you know, are there things you would now recommend or is your moccasin this, it doesn't matter, well, we can just do whatever and you can fix it. No, 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 I, I, I would uh, highly advise against it. Uh, usually I say that if your data is, is crap, no amount of magic will save it. <laughs> Right, and, and I stay in, in our moccasin for that matter. Like the example with, you know, ENCO is thoughtful researchers doing a good design, still running into that problem that then we were able to fix, right? So you want to control. And, and for example, right, if, if your true signal is completely confounded by other things that you don't care about, like gender or age or whatever, the technician that did this, Right, because one technician did the, the control and the other, then I can't help you, right? This, that's not gonna be solved, right? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, uh, one last question. Um, Kartong Tan asks, um, some of the splicing events are quite complex and span quite large regions, for example, intron retention. How do you, how do you accurately call and classify splicing, splicing events detected by short reads? Right, so for intron retention, so I didn't get into the details as well as glossing over it. So I talked a lot about junction spanning reads and how you quantify them and I sort of, but I over I oversimplified it. So that's, that's you know, a person is calling me out on this and is, is right. You can't do this for intron retention. You actually need to compute some coverage level across the intron and then infer that that level of coverage as a, as a sign. That's what we do in this new version of, of the algorithm um, more accurately than we did before. And that some of the adaptations between Magic 1 and 2 is the way we handle this also to do it robustly. But I, I didn't go into those details. Yeah. Okay, so certainly they can reach out to you though. Uh, yeah. um, okay, Yosef, so um, thank you very much. And we'll thank, thank you. Uh, Kathy again, and just remind everyone um, that the next of these um, seminar series is in uh, two weeks on November 4th at, at 4 p.m. through um, University of Rochester. Um, actually, one of my former colleagues, Paul uh, Bouts, is presenting as well as uh, Clara Kilkoff. And of course, you can always go to the RNA Society website um, for more um, information. So I wish you um, all the best. And again, um, thanks for, for joining us today. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, Kathy. Bye, everyone.